Welcome everyone to this edition of Creativity Reframed, a series of conversations with interesting people I know um, who are typically really creative or really interesting business leaders from around the world. What we're going to be exploring is the role of problem solving and creativity through crisis. And in today's session, we're going to get a really different perspective from someone with a truly epic career. Um, he was one of the original DJs at the legendary Hacienda Super Club, which I am pleased to say I managed to frequent back in my heyday. Graham Park has gone on to be one of the world's most famous club DJs and has more recently reimagined the Hacienda through Hacienda Classical. So Graham, absolutely delighted to have you here with me today. How are you doing? Yes, hello. Thanks. I'm very well, thanks for having me. Very yeah, well indeed. Good, good. So the nature of this session is we've got a quick minute blast so we'll just jump straight into it so we've had a few conversations already graham around as mm -hmm. a dj with i guess something that is typically so physical mm -hmm. how are you kind of navigating covid well it, it's been um, quite odd really because obviously clubs are closed then live venues are closed so we've had to postpone our hacienda classical dates to next year and after choosing to take January and February off, despite having offers of gigs, I chose to take January and February off because from the middle of March onwards, my diary went crazy. And of course, suddenly with lockdown, I had to reschedule and postpone all, all the dates. In my business now, especially DJing, it's such a competitive industry. I mean, when I started off in 1984, it didn't have the same kudos as it does now. And the technology didn't exist so that anyone could DJ. You, know, you had to buy lots of records and own expensive turntables. Whereas now anyone very cheaply can set up as a DJ, which is which is great. It doesn't make them any good, but it is good that you can, that you can do it. So the your brand is so important, which is why I'm actually, actually wearing my logo. <laughs> t-shirt for this little broadcast so obviously live streaming is is what me and thousands of other djs have been doing but i've made a point of doing it in such a way that it's got to tick certain boxes it's got to be the right stream on the right platform and for the right reason because anyone can just scroll through their any of their social media platforms and you will see loads and loads of people live live streaming it's better to do it in, in a certain way so you can focus people's attention mm. and make sure it's of, of good quality and at the right time and for the right reasons rather than just do it for, for the sake of it because i think, think even when we slowly get back to normal and clubs and live venues start to open i do think live streaming um until we can get back to full capacity live streaming has still got a role to play in conjunction with um, live performances so it's been important i think to say to people right i'm going to live stream and this is how mm. but of course there's no money in it yes lots of money has been raised for health charities and nighttime industry charities but up until two weeks ago i was doing two three live streams a week yeah. a lot of them from home some of them with with united we stream gm which meant going to a tv studio in berry but i taking the last two weeks off and I'm going to take the, ne the next two weeks off because people have to realise that you don't want people to get used to just having this constant live streaming for, for no cost. Yeah. Because when venues open, just say, for example, the two metre rule does stay. Oh, but will it though? Because everyone's talking about how it might become a, a one metre rule. Sure. That's no good to live venues because a really good friend of mine who owns a sub club in Glasgow, Mike Grieve, the capacity is just over 400 yeah. and they need about 350 to kind of break even yeah so if you have two meter two meter distancing stays in effect for clubs he won't be able to make money but if you open with a reduced capacity maybe you can charge a premium for a physical ticket to be there yeah but then stream the event online and charge us a fee for a, a virtual ticket so yeah. you can watch it in real time that might be a short-term solution but there are literally thousands, ten, probably hundreds of thousands of musicians, performers. It's not just DJs, it's musicians, performers, but also the people who work behind the bar, the people who work in the courtroom, the people who collect the glasses, yeah. the students who rely on the part-time income. So we need just need some guidance from, from the government that's not mixed guidance because it seems to be a different message every yeah. day depending on, on which cabinet minister is, uh, is talking. 
Yeah. Okay, so it's very frustrating. When we chatted about this, Graham, one of the things that I guess is one of the positives, I think, through this was what was what was your kind of listening audience? You did a 12 hour session, didn't you? Oh, a yes, marathon. No. How many people listened to that? A United Extreme GM, which is um, part of Mayor of Greater Manchester's office, it's an initiative that they've had along with the people who run the warehouse project, is to put this amazing content online and to raise money for health charities and nighttime economy charities in Greater Manchester. We've, we did two Hacienda house parties and they they were like one and a half million streams. Yep. But a, a day, the 30th of May was available and the Hacienda manager, a guy called Fletch, said, you know that 12-hour DJ set we've been trying to arrange for you in a club for the past few years, but we've never got it together. How would you fancy doing it for United Stream? And I just went, yes. Didn't think about it till two days before and thought, oh my God, I'm doing 12 hours. But over 400,000 people watched, which which I was quite pleased with. Brilliant. And it flew past. I think it was because I didn't look at my watch till about half past four. That helped. And I didn't look at <laughs> social media because I was con- concentrating. But when it got to midnight, I could have carried on. Yeah. But, what, but what I did was I just played all the stuff that I used to play when I started DJing in the early 80s. And I didn't actually play any house music until half past yeah. nine. So nine and a half hours of soul, funk, disco, hip hop, rap, pop. I even played pop music. And I think, judging from the many kind words I've had afterwards, it was a real mix of people. People who are aware of who I am, but are too young to have seen me at Hacienda or on the early part of my career. Yeah, but people who follow followed me for years, so it, it was really a great thing to do. But as soon as I left and drove home, half past midnight, I'm in the car getting onto the M62, and I suddenly started thinking of all these records that I wish I'd played but hadn't played, and that was after a 12 <laughs> hour session. But how here's a question for you how many records do you think I played in 12 hours? Oh, I would say 60 in 12 hours, way off 151. Wow, about 12 an hour. More oh my god take. but i love but the fact great. that you were still yeah. thinking about what you could play graham <laughs> yeah well you know I'm, I'm thinking when lockdown's over i might even do this 12 hour thing in a, in a venue but it's, it's weird because live streaming is great and mm-hmm. it reminds people you're still there and, and you yep. still get to do what you do which is share a, a, a great selection of new music that you think yep. people should be aware of and and classic tunes, that, but I I dig out the classic tunes that people have forgotten about. But I think it's important just to to keep people's attention and remind them they're there. But but the thing is, it's difficult because you don't have an audience. And one of the thing about DJing is you feed off the audience. Yes. So I might yep. be driving to a gig, and in my head I I've got a rough idea of what I want to do, and then the audience might change your whole attitude. I'm I miss the audience greatly. Yeah. Is that our 10 minute and a blast there, Graham? We are already at our 10 yeah. minute moment. That's just bonkers, isn't it? I feel like we literally oh, could have, you know, just scratched the surface on it. But I think it's just been fascinating. I think as we've talked about before, I, I actually think democratization of what you do. I think through Absolutely. COVID, of hearing so many kind of friends and people that perhaps haven't been to a club for maybe 20 years that are almost kind of replugging back in. And kind of, you know, a lot of people have said that. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people have said that. Yeah, people have said, and people have been um, interacting um, without being together. So they've had like the stream on uh, one device, but then Zoom with all their friends on another device. Yeah, and then maybe another device with another thing, and and, and that's really good. And then if you do follow it on social media, um, not the twelve-hour stream, I avoided it. But if I'm doing like a Facebook Live or or a Mixcloud Live. In real time, you can see people commenting and you can respond instantly. Yeah. That's as close as you get to, as you get to a crowd. But I do yeah. miss seeing the whites of people's eyes. Absolutely. And I'm sure those those whites of the eyes were very large, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But listen, I'm going to let you go. Um, it's been a pleasure, as always, to chat to you. Um, take it easy. Enjoy your rest. Um, and I look forward to your next 24-hour marathon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Take care, Graham. I'll see you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.